All right, do me a favor. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Familiar passage here. We're in an awesome series called Searching for Significance, Finding Meaning in the Mundane. And we're going to have a lot of redundancy these next four weeks in our life. So this is an awesome opportunity to lean into what we're talking about. And then about halfway through, I'm going to have my good friend Abel share with us this morning the second half of this concept of kingdom that we're continuing to examine together as a church. So Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27 says this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who has built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this amazing morning. Pray for those at home right now. We thank you, God, that faith can fill every house. Lord, it said that your gospel spread from house to house, and as persecution came, they began to meet in their homes. God, we thank you that right now around the world, people are experiencing church in the house. And Lord, we are grateful that you're building up your body. Lord, we ask for all of those as they break bread together, as many of us here will leave and, and get together and get connected this week, God, build the fabric of our community stronger during this time. Where the assault of the enemy would want us to isolate and separate, we say we will not separate. But Lord, join us together to make us stronger. We pray for all those that are immune compromised right now in Jesus' name. Strengthen their systems now. We say in Jesus' name, COVID-19, you will bow to the authority of Jesus Christ. You will not stand in this nation. You will not stand in the countries of the world. And we declare healing power to come, that this would not be assault against the church. This would not be assault against the nation. God, we declare that you are our great provider. And in this time of need, we say act. We say spirit of fear, go in Jesus' name. We will stand confident in the love of God. You are a righteous king, and you are the one in charge, and you are the one on the throne. Lord, as our government has called us to a day of prayer, we stand in faith. We thank you, Lord, like at 9-11, when the nation stopped for a moment and many gave their lives to you. We pray that this would not be a moment when many would turn to you for temporary meeting of their needs, but God, they would bow to the name of Jesus. The repentance would fill our culture. Revival would break out amongst the grocery stores. God, you would do a work in our midst as we trust you. Help us be the church in our time of need. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, we're going to get through this. Cover up. Cover up. It was the 12th century, and a small republic in Europe won a few strategic wars. And as they won these wars, they decided to build a tower to celebrate their newfound victory. As they built this tower, the governor commanded, let it be built immediately. So they began construction of this eight-story bell tower. And as they built this eight-story bell tower, it started to sink. We now know it as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. As they begin to build and construct this tower, as it continued to go up, about 100 years later, they noticed it was going to fall on their cathedral. So they built the other side taller to help counterbalance. Well, it began this, this construction process that would last several centuries, all the way up until 1960, when they actually had to remove the bell from the bell tower. As they removed the bell from the bell tower, they continued construction. It has now been one of the most expensive buildings in the history of the world for its maintenance. Now, when you examine why did this tower begin to sink, because the foundation was too small. And as they examine this leaning tower, and now if they've done these counterbalances, they've examined that they built this tower with a foundation only nine feet deep. Nine feet. Well, this fear of skyscrapers tumbling upon cities started to spread. So in 1900, when New York became this bustling city of success, they built the first skyscraper on American soil. It's called the Tower Building. 
was to begin to build this tower building. They started to talk about the fears that everyone had of these towers toppling, what happens if a hurricane hits or some type of storm comes or an earthquake. So they begin to share about the foundation. So there's this magazine called The Century Magazine. They had this elaborate article where they shared about the necessity of foundations. But what was unique about New York compared to any other area was they had built a foundation underneath that every building could tap into. So the foundation of the tower building was approximately 100 feet deep, but it tapped into a greater foundation. And here's the picture they released in The Century Magazine. As you look here, there's the skyscraper up top, and down below is the foundation that they had set in place. Literally every building was built upon rock and sand and granite because they were prepared for the future. They were preparing to build a city that could last and withstand any storm. See, how you build, the foundation you set determines your future outcome. And as Jesus is declaring the goodness of the kingdom of God and its arrival, he gives the most famous sermon ever preached. It's called, you know, the great, this great sermon here, Matthew 5, 7 through, five, chapter 5 through chapter 7. There we go. We will rewind that one. <laughs> Greatest sermon ever preached. Sermon on the Mount. But as he gives this sermon, he ends it with a chilling parable. And this chilling parable begins to talk about foundations. It says, everyone who builds their house on a rock, when wind come, when rain falls, when the flood breaks open, behold, the rock will break those waves. However, those that build on sand, their foundation won't stand. Now, here's what we have to understand. We're removed from the context of that culture. Why would someone build on sand? Now, many of us are used to beaches, and we're used to Folsom Lake. Sand is soft. This is Palestine we're talking about. When you would walk on the sand, as Bob was out there in Pakistan, the sand appears, because it's so dry, to be firm. It appears to be something that will withstand a storm. See, in order to build on a rock, it would take tremendous effort to get there. Why would you want to build on a rock? You're removed from the city. You're removed from so many people. You would have to haul up all your materials to a place that's difficult to get to. And this is what Jesus says. Those that hear my message and do my message are those that are building their life on this rock that will stand. Now, for many of us, when we hear this parable, we've heard it preached hundreds of times, we think this. Those that build their house on the rock are those that believe in Jesus. And those that build their house on the sand are those that have not given their life to Jesus. That's not true. It has nothing to do about a statement of faith. It has to do, did you put his word into action? Yep. Amen. This message, he says, it's the word logos. As you have this message, now many of us have heard the message, but he says, unless you put it into action, it really isn't going to take effect. It's not going to work. We all know there's two key ingredients to a foundation in the natural. That's cement and steel. You need both for a foundation to stand. And what Jesus says is this. Here's the materials. It's called my message. It's called the good news. But unless you put it into practice, you're not going to withstand the storm. He says this, there's going to be wind, there's going to be rain, there's going to be a flood. This wind, this word in Greek literally means atmospheric change. When the winds come, will your house stand? See, this is one thing we have to understand is that the atmosphere can determine how you respond. When you walked in that grocery store this week, guess what was contagious? Not COVID-19, fear. Yep. Come on. Fear is a contagion. You know what else is a contagion? Religion. Jesus says, beware of one thing. Beware of what? The yeast of the Pharisees. Yep. Brilliant documentary called Cooked. And in Cooked, he talks about how they would make yeast and bread back in the first century. And what you would do is you take water and ground flour, and you would bring this now new mixture into the air and let it sit. Why? Because yeast is atmospheric. And as the wild yeast would begin to form inside the bread, that's how yeast would grow. Religion and fear are atmospheric. But you know what will overcome that faith? You know what will overcome that? 
love and power and confidence and courage that only comes from putting the works of Jesus, the words of Jesus into practice in your life. So what happens? We have this word, this concept called kingdom. And I believe for many of us, we have this amazing diet of the love of God in the modern church. But it's lacking one key ingredient, one key nutrient called kingdom. We have a kingdom deficiency in our diet. We have to understand is that without kingdom, we'll be like everyone else in culture without kingdom and confidence that we have a God whose kingdom is greater than the kingdoms of this world, we will bow down in fear like many now. We have to understand we serve a God that is king, that has given us authority to walk in power. This is our inheritance. This is what we have. And see, we talk a lot about the love of God. And again, I don't want to undermine that. It's important. You need to know that you have a father that cares, that loves you and gives you an identity. But guess what? If you have an enabling dad at home when a war breaks out, you're going to feel confident when there's someone coming over the hill. But if you have a dad that can throw down in the time of crisis, if you have a dad that's a king, that's equipped for battle, I'm confident in my house. And many of us right now don't know the nature of the God we serve. We have a God that is all-powerful, that spoke the world into existence. Guess what? You have power. You have power in your words. You have power in how you speak. You have power in how you act. And this is our kingdom responsibility in this very moment to speak faith in the midst of fear. See, tomorrow when you're at home from work, guess who else is at home? Every one of your neighbors. Guess who is isolated? Every one of your neighbors. Guess what we have opportunity to do? Spread love and share love challenge you. Knock on those doors. Watch them be terrified. Speak faith in the midst of fear. Knock on that door and say, hey, what needs do you have practically? I'm headed to the store. Why would you do that? Because I trust that God will protect me. What are your needs? This is our agency called kingdom. Now, when you study the word kingdom in Matthew, it's used 53 times. You compare that to love 11 times, joy 6 times, peace 3 times. Kingdom is this dominant concept that Matthew's trying to communicate about what kingdom was arriving. And John makes this announcement in Matthew 3. And he says, behold, the kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe. He makes this messianic pronouncement. He's the messenger. Guess what they would call messengers in that time? Evangelists or angels. Those that would deliver the message. So he comes and he delivers this message. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is now in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And as he's tempted by the devil and he has all these things presented to him, he's been fasting for 40 days and he stands and withstands all the temptations that Israel faced inside the wilderness. What happens? He tempts him with food. He tempts him with popularity. He says, go and throw yourself from the top of the tower of the temple. Number three, what does he say? He presents to him all the kingdoms of the world. He says, if you bow down to me and worship me, I'll give you these. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Why did he have power and confidence to do this? Because he knew the kingdom that was being presented was a counterfeit kingdom. He knew the kingdom... He came to represent was the authentic kingdom, and the kingdoms of this world paled in comparison to the one he represented. We have an entire generation that's being presented with a counterfeit kingdom right now called popularity, called following, called influence. But guess what? Those things crumble when the floods, the rains, and the rivers begin to get released. If your kingdom's economy, it will cave in. If your kingdom's success, it will crumble. But if you stand in behalf of the kingdom of heaven, nothing will be shaken. And it's in this place we have confidence to stand in a God that, guess what, is a king who is good and powerful and loves us. That gives you authority when you walk into any room. You represent one that is greater than any opposition in front of you. And he gives you power to pray for those in need. So as soon as he leaves the wilderness, he walks on the scene. He declares the kingdom of heaven. And what does Jesus do? He prays for the sick. 
He heals those in need. He restores them to life. He begins to teach on kingdom, and he uses all these parables, all these hard concepts for us to grasp because we're so far removed from them. And for many of us, when you study kingdom, watch what Jesus does right afterwards. He represents the kingdom of heaven with power. And this is our inheritance. This is our opportunity. He says, kingdom, it's like yeast. Kingdom, it's like a pearl. It's like treasure. He uses all these examples. It's like a net, Matthew 13. And we walk away confused. But here's one thing I've come to understand. All of them are valuable. All of them take time. Kingdom takes time to cultivate in your life. Kingdom takes intentionality. How do we make this practical? We have to invite Jesus into our space and say, Holy Spirit, what does living your kingdom look like today? And we all have four weeks to put it into practice. We all have four weeks to say, Jesus, who do you want me to call? Who do you want me to tell? Who do you want me to make a meal for now? This is our opportunity. After... He shares about the kingdom. The disciples naively say they understand all the parables. He then says that they're masters of the house. They're like CEOs in modern time. He sends them out. In Matthew 14, he gets word that his friend, his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. He then goes to a place of isolation. He goes to a quarantine. But what happens? The masses follow because they're in need. He recognizes the need. He says he cured them. He restored them. It's literally where we get the word therapy from. I promise you this week, you're going to have lots of counseling opportunities, my friends. And you have a choice to hit ignore on that phone call or hit accept and show some love in a listening ear. It's going to take time. It's going to cost you something. For many of us... God's not called you just to isolate, but to live intentional in this time. And as they're there, the disciples say, Jesus, you got to send these people away, Matthew 14. And what's Jesus' response? Send them away. You feed them. Now, these are poor, broke, college student disciples. <laughs> they have nothing. They said, we've exhausted our coffee budget, Jesus. We have nothing left. My Amazon Prime account has run dry. I have nothing. And he says this brilliant phrase. Bring me what you have. Our opportunity in this moment, when we feel like we have few answers, is to bring Jesus all we got. And let's see him multiply the work of his kingdom these next four weeks.